It's a great pleasure for me this evening to join John, as he did at the beginning of Mass, in welcoming you all to this, I think it's the 14th Eucharistic Convention. And as he mentioned, I had the great privilege this morning of getting up at about four in the morning to go out to the airport to meet his eminence here. And um, it was a great pleasure to meet him. I've been able to spend the day with Cardinal McCarrick and um, he really is a delight and you're really going to enjoy listening to him over this weekend. I said to Mons Cronin just beforehand, I said, I thought I'd speak at the Mass because he's going to speak afterwards and I don't want him to crash. And Monsignor just looked down his nose at me and he said, just because we're elderly doesn't mean to say we're all weak. <laughs> So, mea culpa. But anyway, when I uh, met the Cardinal with Bill, we had a cup of coffee and then we went out into the car park and I was slightly bemused as I saw the Cardinal going to the wrong side of the car to get in. <laughs> and I think we've all had the experience of being in a foreign country. You know, and it, you sort of, you think you, you, don't know, you don't know the money, you can't work out the money, you, you can't speak the language, you don't know where you are in the city, you don't know what side of the car to get into. It's all very confusing. And one priest friend of mine, Father Craig Larkin, whom some of you may, have, may know, um, he, he told me a lovely story of his first visit to Italy. And he said he really began to get culture shock. Everyone was speaking Italian. Italian drivers are terrible, you know, honking the horn. And he, he said his nerves were really on edge. And he thought, I'm going to hate this place. But one of the things he'd always wanted to do was to go up to the roof of St. Peter's. He said, I don't know quite why I wanted to do this, but it was something he wanted to do. So he set off one morning and he said he was walking along the road and sure enough, there were the Italian motorists, honk, 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 honk. And he thought, oh, this place is terrible. And everyone who walked past was speaking Italian and he thought, oh my God, how will I survive here? Then he arrived in St. Peter's Square and there'd been a big rally there the night before and there was rubbish all over the, the square and he thought, oh, these Italians, you know, this is terrible. So he thought, well, he, he went on and then he went into the church and when he went into the church, there were tourists everywhere and they were taking photos. <laughs> Paul, they were taking photos. And he... Um, and they were talking, and he thought, oh, the Italian, oh, this is terrible. And so then he thought, well, I'm still going to go up onto the, you know, to the balcony. And he started climbing up the little stairs inside the wall, as it were, up to the roof of St. Peter's. And as he, was, as he was going up there, what did he see on the wall? But graffiti, you know, hi, I'm from New York, you know, <laughs> I'm from Washington, D.C., your eminence. And he, he thought, oh, my goodness, tourism, oh, you know, this place is terrible. Anyway, he said he then he got up onto the roof and he looked out from the roof of St. Peter's and he saw the, he saw the, the, you know, the columns going out St. Peter's Square. He saw all the beauty, the beauty of the whole thing. And he said he was too high up to see all the rubbish in the square and he couldn't hear the honking of the horns and there was no one speaking Italian and there was no graffiti around. And he said, suddenly he just saw the big picture. He saw the beauty. He saw the beauty of the whole St. Peter's and what it meant. And I was thinking that when we come to the Eucharistic Convention, it's like going to the roof of St. Peter's. We come to look again at the big picture. And the theme for the Eucharistic Convention this year is a beautiful one. Behold his face. And so we come to the convention, we forget all about the hassles with the traffic and trying to find a car park and would it be raining when I get out of the car or would it not? We've come to behold his face, to look at the face of Jesus. And that's something that, that all our lives we long to do, to see the face of Jesus. But what we struggle with all the time are distractions. Can I find a car park? What will the traffic be like? You know, <laughs> the, and there's distractions within and there's distractions without. And Kath Catherine de Hewitt Doherty is a spiritual writer. She, I think she lives in America now. She founded the Madonna House Apostolate. She was a Russian baroness, but a beautiful spiritual writer. And 
in one of her writings, she, she has a lovely reflection. She said, you know, she said, when I think about who I am, she said, I think, I sort of, can, I can see three people in me. She said, one is the Baroness. The Baroness loves God and really wants to serve God and she writes spiritual books and she founded the Madonna House Apostolate and she really wants to live a very spiritual life. That's the Baroness. But she said, when I look into my heart, I can see another person too. I can see Catherine. And Catherine loves long baths and she likes nice meals and beautiful clothes. And she's not actually very religious at all. In fact, she sort of resents the Baroness at times. And at times she even hates her because she just wants to live a good life, live a happy life, enjoy good food and beautiful clothes and long baths. Um, that's Catherine. I was, I was saying this to some people once and some, one lady said, I quite like the sound of Catherine. <laughs> but anyway, so she's got the Baroness and she said she's got Catherine, but she said, when I look into my heart, deeply into my heart, she said, I think I can see someone else. She said, I can see a little girl who loved growing up in her native Finland and just lying in the grass and watching the clouds and daydreaming. And she, she was writing in her 80s and she said, you know, she said, now that I'm in my 80s, she said, when I think about the Baroness and Catherine and the little girl, she said, I feel more like the Baroness. She said, I long more for Catherine. But she said, you know, I think the person I really am is the little girl just lying in the grass, watching the clouds, daydreaming. I think that might be who I really am. And I was thinking that, that in some ways, isn't that what our Lord said? And you, unless you become like little children, you cannot enter the kingdom. But we've got all these struggles, each of us, the Baroness, Catherine, the little girl, could me, the bishop, Patrick, and the little kid. Um, we're all, and, we're, and in some ways we're all three. And I was thinking, in Easter week, that St. Peter must have been like that. Peter wore different hats. And after the resurrection, St. Peter was feeling pretty scarred. Jesus had called him, made him the leader of the twelve, made him the rock. And Peter had, had all sorts of dreams as Jesus spoke of the kingdom. Peter was thinking, wow, I'm number one, you know, and, and I'll stick with him. And he'd made those promises to our Lord, you know, even if all of those, these others leave you, you can trust me. And after the resurrection, he was feeling pretty damaged, wasn't he? Three times he'd even denied that he knew Jesus. What is very interesting to notice in the gospel tonight, what does Peter do? You can, feel, you can sort of, you know, there's all these Easter appearances. Peter's feeling pretty shame-faced. Peter says he goes back to the beginning. He goes back fishing. Goes back to the Sea of Tiberias where Jesus first called him. That's rather a lovely thought. It's a nice thing for us to do too occasionally is, is to go back. Go back to where Jesus was really close to me. Go back to some time, even in our memory, where Jesus called me. We, and we've all got moments like that. We can look back and think, I wish I, wish I could, have been, could be so, as enthusiastic as I was then. And that's what Peter did. He goes back to the Sea of Galilee and Jesus once again confirms him in his faith, confirms him. I was thinking, poor old Peter, as he goes back, Peter the fisherman, he's not much of a fisherman, is he? <laughs> I don't think he's ever, there's ever any record of him catching fish without a bit of help from Jesus, you know. And yet he goes back, he goes back to what he was familiar with and there Jesus calls him once again and recommissions him. And my prayer is that the Eucharistic Convention will be a moment like that for each of us, that we come back, we come back to this beautiful annual gathering 
and we, we behold the face of Jesus, we get new strength from Jesus to be his disciples. Jesus who looks on us with love and asks, asks us to serve him in love. Because without that, we can't be his disciples. Th this whole, the power of, of this, just the simple loving service of Jesus was brought home to me very powerfully earlier this year, just a couple of months ago, with the, the death of Bishop Loft. Those of you who are visitors to Auckland might not know that Bishop Gerard Loft was a New Zealand missionary priest and bishop who worked for 40 years in the Solomon Islands. And then the time came when he had to leave his beloved Solomon Islands for health reasons and come back to New Zealand. And he said to me, he said, can I just serve in any way? I just want to be a pastor. And so he worked in a couple of parishes in Auckland. What, ta what, I just must finish this little story. He, at the beginning of this year, he was in Thames for 18 months, and then he came back to Auckland and he went to Beechhaven Parish. And on the first Sunday of February, there was a great welcome for Bishop Gerard. And the people were enthused by him, just his simplicity and his, um, his loving nature. And he was welcomed on the first Sunday of February, and late that afternoon he was talking to the pastoral worker in the parish and suddenly dropped dead in front of her. So the, the parish, and I can see Beechhaven parishioners here, was stunned and shocked. But over the next couple of days, what touched me as we had little vigil masses at Beechhaven and then down at Thames where he'd worked for 18 months, that how much he had touched people's hearts just by his gentleness, his kindness, that... Um, that, that he didn't have airs, he just served gently, and yet he touched so many hearts. And he never let show how much it cost him to leave the Solomons. That was the great sacrifice, just to leave it to others, but still to serve the Lord. And he came here uncomplaining, and just in that loving, gentle manner, um, served, served Jesus now back in his homeland in New Zealand. At the funeral, there were lovely stories told about Bishop Jerry. One of the ones that I liked very much was, he tells the story how he almost ended up married. I don't know if any of you heard this, but he was a great linguist. And in the Solomons, there are many languages. And he, he was a master linguist. And one of the things he used to like to do in Alki, he'd go down to, on market day, he'd go down to the market and he just used to sit there and, um, you know, chat to people as he saw them, and they'd come and they'd see Bishop Jerry and come and have a chat to him. Anyway, he was sitting there one day having a smoke. He never quite dropped that habit. Um, and he was having a cigarette, and he heard he, there was a man sort of a couple of tables over with his daughter. They had been selling stuff at the market. And he heard him speak to his daughter in the, in the language of the people of the north, which people at the market wouldn't have understood, but Bishop Jerry picked it up. And he, he heard this man saying to his daughter, he said, gosh, he said, I'd love a smoke. He said, you see that white fella over there? He said, if he were going to offer me a cigarette, he said, I'd let him have you as his wife to his daughter. <laughs> so Bishop Jerry heard this, and he was smoking away, so he pulled out his cigarette paper and he, uh, his tobacco and rolled a cigarette. And he got up, and he went over to this chap, and he said, in his own language, he said, would you like a cigarette? And the chap was astounded that he could speak his own language. And he said, oh, thank you very much. You know, so he took the cigarette. And then Bishop Jerry said, what about the second part of the bargain? <laughs> <laughs> and he said at that, at that, the daughter got up and shot off into the bush. <laughs> well, I was thinking, you haven't shot off into the bush and you've all turned up for another Eucharistic convention. So let's pray that we'll behold the face of Jesus. We'll see him more clearly, love him more dearly, and follow him more nearly.